Welcome to Householders, a conversation about American life as Zen practice. I'm Inga Annie Wade. And I'm Kyosaku John Mitchell, and we're lay members of the Atlanta Soto Zen Center. I went to the Zen Center on Sunday. It was the first time I'd been in a few weeks, I mean, over a month, actually. Um, uh, I don't know, just sort of had safer vibes about the world <laughs> than I had for the past few weeks, so I decided to go. And there was a new person there that I didn't know, a uh, young guy, and uh, he was sitting, I was sitting on one end of a row of, uh, of Zafus and he was on the other opposite end. Uh, and, um, Shinjin Mike Goldman sensei was sitting directly between us. And there were some interesting moments during the sit where Shinjin sensei made adjustments to his posture and, the, uh, the, the, and the second time, uh, asked if he wanted to sit in a chair because he was shaking, his legs were shaking or something. Uh, and I couldn't, who asked who Shinjin asked the the new guy, if he wanted to sit in a chair, he, he made a couple of adjustments to his posture. And then finally was like, I think you should go sit in a chair. Well, he didn't say, I think you should go sit in a chair. This is kind of what I wanted to talk about. He said, uh, I can feel you shaking from over here. Would you like to sit in a chair? And so uh-huh. then he set him up in a chair. And uh, it occurred to me that this was the first time I'd ever seen anybody, any of the teachers in our sangha make posture adjustments to uh, someone sitting in the zendo, which is a very classic Zen situation, right? That's, that's the teacher's formal role. But formally, it's a pretty forceful adjustment, usually, and even in some cases involves smacking them with a stick, which... Well, I don't... I mean, <laughs> again, not unless you ask, but... Right. Uh, th- usually when they adjust your posture at the Zento, they just bring around a ruler mm-hmm. and, like, you know, like, kind of see if it's, like, your back straight and, you know, it's at the correct angle. So they've done that to me a few times where they're just like, okay, let's, you know, get the ruler, check it, and, you know, just slightly adjust me to the correct form. Well, I want to hear more about your experience getting adjusted in our sangha because that that was sort of what I was impressed by was that we have – that Shinjin was demonstrating, you know, his style of providing adjustment. And, like, I got a really interesting window into our lineage – from that, you know, in contrast to the way that traditional hardcore Japanese Zen posture adjustments are made. And the, the, the two things that I thought were interesting were it was good consent language. You know, it was it was voluntary and it was asking if the guy would like an adjustment, which I found nice. But also it was noteworthy to me that Shinjin was speaking out loud during Zazen uh, Wait, in order to make so those adjustments. Like, was it loud? No, it was, he was, it was like above a whisper though. Okay. You know? Uh, so it was of course noticeable. So and other people could hear him. Yeah. And I certainly could, uh, sitting next, sitting right on the other side of Shinjin. And so, and I have kind of mixed feelings about that. Like on the one hand, you know, talking in the Zendo, I'm not sure about that. But on the other, it is lighthearted. It's not, it's not like treating the Zendo as this hermetically sealed space of sanctity. And I appreciate that aspect of it too. So, you know, but bottom line is Shinjin is one of the teachers and what he says in the Zendo goes. So that's, that's what we have as a, as a norm. And I, I, uh, I appreciated it. And it also felt very distinctively us. Um, so, and I, I, you know, I haven't had my posture adjusted in this endo. So I, I, and you're saying you have, so, uh, tell me what that's been like. 
you go to the beginners, it's it's pretty common for them to kind of go around and, and check postures because it's like seen as like, well, this is maybe like the first time that people are sitting in this posture. Sure. So we want to start them off on a good foundation and, you know, make sure that they kind of understand um, what that posture is like from the very beginning. So definitely, I think, you know, I probably went to uh, the newcomer the newcomers like three or four times mm -hmm. before doing anything else. I mean, yeah, probably. Cause I also took people there. Yeah. Uh, you know, for their first times. And I was like, I'll join you. Just come on in, you know, my sister, my, um, my dad maybe, or something like that, just mm -hmm. to get them acquainted with it. Um, because it is so, you know, Zazen is so posture based. Yeah. Um, that I really do feel like it is good to, to do a newcomers before you come in and mm -hmm. kind of build that foundation. And maybe that was what this guy needed to do as well. Kind of go into the, the newcomers first and, yeah, uh, learn the correct like posture. Maybe he was tr struggling with it a little bit, like not exactly sure how to get the correct way. There was a while where. I think Ian wasn't sure about the posture, but you know how you can like put one leg in front of the other yeah. to sort of get that like grounding thing, mm -hmm. but it wasn't explained to him in a way that he was understanding what they were trying to say. So it took him a while as well. Yeah. So I think that is, you know, where um, newcomers can be really helpful because that is just kind of like your initial like posture mm -hmm. check there. How has it felt for you to get to receive adjustments from the teachers in our lineage? Because I've had difficult experiences with having my posture adjusted in other places at other times. Well, I guess, you know, in the beginning, you might have this kind of like, you might be a little nervous mm -hmm. um, and you want to do it right. And if someone comes up to you and adjusts your posture, you could feel like, ha, oh, I didn't do it right. Like they're, they're correcting me, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not doing the thing that they want me to do. And they're physically coming over there and adjusting my posture. So that can make, I'm sure that can make people nervous. It, <laughs> um, you know, I, but we don't want to have these expectations of like what's right or what's wrong. Like, oh, you did something wrong because your posture is not correct. Yeah. It's just, uh, you know, it's just what we do. It's not really like a right or wrong scenario. It's just kind of like, this is how we do the posture. Um, I don't really get, when they check, I'm usually sitting correctly. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe that has to do with like doing yoga beforehand. So I have been like maybe physically adjusted i don't remember it like hurting my feelings or anything um mm -hmm. <laughs> but i think that anytime i i mean i don't know i just feel like meditation can be a vulnerable place sure you know and being corrected in the middle of of that i think can be kind of vulnerable but i think it's still the right thing to do mm -hmm. i think that you don't want to like exercise in in the wrong posture. You oh know? yeah. You don't want to be doing lunges in a way that's going to hurt your joints or muscles or something like that. And I think there's also the potential for zazen for you to, you know, maybe maybe you can, you won't be able to sit there for as long if you're not in the correct posture or, yeah. you know you won't be able to um or you know maybe maybe you could could hurt your back or something like that i don't know so i think that that is the correct way to do it you know or or fall over i think that's what some people have said like okay if you're not in the correct position you might just start leaning over at some point because you're not like very grounded is the whole the whole thing um and i think that that posture in general has become more important the older I get because, you know, you start feeling 
the problems associated with bad posture. Mm-hmm. You know, like sitting in a slouching in a chair all day. And we all sit in chairs all day, so <laughs> that can be a big problem. And I think that's that's nice. So, you know, in some ways it's like, yeah, you're meditating, but you're also like practicing a good posture. That that could yeah. that benefit could help you out throughout your day too. I almost don't see them as separate benefits anymore because of the extent to which my posture and my breathing and my practice have kind of become all one thing, you know? So so having correct posture throughout my day is doing Zen practice. And likewise, doing Zen practice throughout the day is having correct posture. And so like whichever one is... Whichever one I feel like isn't happening, I can adjust, you know, just in my body. And that is what comes with practice, I think. So, you know, that's definitely a demonstration of the importance of posture adjustment in Zazen because it's how you learn to associate posture and breathing with the, with the, with the practice of Zen so that when you're sitting and doing whatever you're doing or when you're moving around and not sitting and doing whatever you're doing, that whole complex of things is still accessible. But there's, there's, a, there's a virtue element to meditation you've sort of alluded to that I feel like, I mean, it, it shouldn't, you know, it's, it's, it's not good that it's, that it's this way and it's been this way for me or it was this way many years ago for me at the beginning. Uh, and it, and I'm really glad it doesn't feel this way anymore, but there is a sort of problem of doing it right in meditation that I think is more intense than doing it right in, you know, exercise, like you were saying, like th- there's, there's a, there's a religious factor. Sure. Sure. I, I think there are people, uh, teachers, and I don't want to name them yeah. by name, but <laughs> Or gender. <laughs> there are some people in our lineage that are a little bit more uh, rigorous and strict with the way th- things are and correcting people in an almost disapproving mm. way. And that that has definitely intimidated me. Yeah. So, yeah, I can see your point with that. And I think as Americans, especially, we don't really like being told how to do things. Right. Um, you know, but there is this, this sanctity of the, the postures and and the ritual ritualistic rules that they, they want to protect, uh, that maybe the younger generations or even maybe just, um, I don't know. Cause we're American too. We don't really, you know, necessarily have that same reverence for it. Yeah. For even just formality itself. Sure. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think I think that we actually I mean, that was sort of what impressed me about the correction that Shinjin Jin made is that it was pretty informal feeling. Uh, and that goes with a lot of other stuff that we do that we've talked about, um, you know, from the way we talk during the talking parts and the things we t- even the things we talk about, the things that people come prepared uh, to talk about on Sundays after Zaza. And it's often, you know, like music or, uh, you know, science or something, you know, something not religious in nature. And that, that kind of informality, um, I think is supportive of our Sangha. And I think that along with that, um, you know, there's no like codes about clothing either in the Zendo. Yeah. I mean, it says on the website, like try to wear muted clothes that are comfortable. Don't wear perfume. That's the main thing. The value I hear, at least as far as other people are affected, both in those instru- in both of those instructions is is not to distract other people. Yeah. Which is reasonable. And sort of you could say that's why Zen clothing is so plain and dark colored. You could sort of assume that that's the functional reason. But I think that there's also obviously like a religious significance to everybody looking exactly the same. Oh, absolutely. I mean, like the Tibetan Buddhist monks wear like bright orange. Right. So it can't be that distracting. Yeah, 
exactly. <laughs> you know, and, they distract it all the time. Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, and like that's th- that's a that's a value, an aesthetic value that I think is comprehensive in Tibetan Buddhism. There's like bright, yeah. crazy looking yeah, they stuff always all have over the bright place. Colors. Yeah. But I went to, the, to if you go to the Tibetan temple here in in Atlanta, it's it's very um, I don't know decadent looking. Like mm-hmm. they have this gigantic altar and it's gold and embroidery and um they have these these dolls and yeah i mean you don't find that at at the zen temples you know in in japan it's probably a little bit more decadent than like our zen temple in atlanta though because i've seen pictures in there i'm like okay well they have like statues and stuff but we're just like we have like little little tiny statues but nothing nothing really expensive or um extravagant yeah it's true like even in a zen temple in a place where like zen is a highly religious form there are ornate things about it for sure and so i sort of that that's sort of what i'm what a little bit what i'm getting at with the wearing black it's like it it is about simplicity and not being distracting or whatever to some extent it has that effect like in a zen way but but it's more than that. It, it, the uniformity of the way that a bunch of monks wearing black robes looks is has to do with the aesthetics of Zen, and that's part of the formality of like a Japanese Zen environment. And our sangha dispenses with that level of formality in favor of just like a recommendation to wear things that are comfortable so they don't distract you and muted and not smelly so they don't distract other people. And as long as you're not distracting other people, you know, it's, it's, uh, you're, you're in uniform. And that isn't to say that, that, that Arzendo is without formality. Like there are rows of elevated Zafus and Zabutans facing the wall and you sit side by side in a traditional Zen form and there's an altar in the center and you face it and you bow to it. And, you know, like we have formality, but it's not strict formality. It's loose formality. It's like, it's, it's casual relationships to a fixed form. And that is a balance that I think is really helpful and supportive to the people maybe in our culture at large and certainly yeah. to the people who come to our sangha. And I, I, I found the posture adjustment that I saw on Sunday to, to be in line with that, uh, value, because it was like, it is important for you to sit up, to sit in a way that's supportable, like, like sustainable and comfortable, uh, and, and helps your concentration and breathing. But it's also not like it's, it's, it's something I'm inviting you to to fix. It's not something I'm going to make you fix so that like the row of people meditating looks identical and perfect like a zen like a photograph of a zen monastery is supposed to. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I I do see this as like kind of a, a all this less lesser rigidity, I guess, is is a is just an effect of of westernizing zen and Mm -hmm. um you know religion isn't a static thing right it it doesn't you know i think people think tend to think of religion as something okay this religion was founded you know in ancient times it's an ancient religion and it's been practiced the same for Mm -hmm. (laughs) thousands of years or whatever i don't know but it's, it's not it's not really like that there's there's so many things that change over time and it's interesting to me because I, I the idea of of something about Zen is that it it is very focused on um, tradition too. Mm-hmm. So there's always this kind of balance of like how much tradition do we keep, you know? Because you have like the tradition of the lineage that's really important to Zen. That's not going to change, probably. Mm-hmm. I can't see that as something going away. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's there's other things that adapt to uh, the place that they are. Um, and it's interesting 
how people decide what what's going to be able to be adapted and what has to stay the same. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of renewed every generation, too, right? And that's sort of why lineage works. Like you, you can you you preserve the idea of lineage transmission as a thing that clearly has been true since like, you know, we trace our lineage all the way back to the Buddha, all lineages of Zen do, you know, when ordaining someone new, you they recite their lineage all the way back to the historical Buddha as a way of saying like, I'm part of this long unbroken thing, but like what they're being transmitted in order to do is like reinvent it completely. Right. And not, and completely is an exaggeration because like they're, whatever it is, is informed by what their teacher taught them and what their sangha that was like under that teacher. But the living person is sort of the one there to give like a posture adjustment to the entire sangha. And posture is not this universal truth about like the human body. It's something that's individually it's it's a it's a framework that's in that's that's applied individually to every single body according to its needs and i think that that is exact an exact description also of like the sangha and its forms and and how those are adjusted to the individual needs of the people in it and the culture that they come from so you know it's almost like the idea of posture the the idea of lineage and the idea of posture are sort of these support structures that are fundamental to what Zen is. But what happens inside of that structure is different and new every time. So like the posture adjustment is in a way like the most important instruction that there is because your Zazen is going to be something different every time. And the posture adjustment is just creating the negative space around that experience so that it happens. Well, it's interesting to me that, like, at what point does it not become, like, the same mm -hmm. religion anymore, you mm. know? Like, it's like, okay, you know, Soto Zen branched off. Uh-huh. And, you know, because they're like, this is, they believe this is different enough that it's no longer, like, Rinzai or mm -hmm. whatever it branched off from. I should know this. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, it's like it, it's complicated. It goes back into history in China. And there were five schools that sort of split. There, I mean, really, but you can it, it, it is really interesting to look at what the splits were and why they happened. And like the big one we always talk about is sudden versus gradual, you know, which. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Which every teacher who like really gets into it says is a made up distinction that like. Zen I, is both. I, yeah, I mean, I, like I know. I'm like, I feel like it's a made up distinction. Like, I don't really know. Yeah, um, I'll just <laughs> yeah. say that. But, but I, but I do know that also. You know, the, the thing that um, that that Dogen said was that oh, um, you know that that we're already Buddha nature, mm -hmm. and so we don't have to become Buddha nature. We're just returning to what already is. Yeah. Um, and. So that's that that is interesting to me, but he's he's coming from I went to China to find this out. So is it really different from what other people already thought? Mm. Well, I mean, I think what was interesting about that moment of was that he was in he was in Rinzai training uh, because that was the dominant form in Japan. And I and I think it probably felt like it was too strident too intense given that truth about buddha nature like that's not that was his emphasis for sure but that's not like a uniquely soto idea that's like that goes back to like bodhidharma and beyond like it's, right. it's it's just like a very core very old mahayana idea um and 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 he probably was seeing it overlooked by these like sort of fierce militaristic Rinzai practitioners trying super hard to realize that truth. And Dogen had this inkling of like, you don't have to try hard to realize that truth. It's absurd that to, to, to try. So he pursued that line of thinking back to the 
you know, Soto school in China and learned it and brought it back. And it, and it flowered immediately in Japan because there was like this needed posture adjustment that had to happen uh, because Rinzai had become overly strict and formalized. And, and it's, you know, it's the same thing. Every, every like movement within Zen, just to keep it limited to Zen for the sake of (laughs) talking about something that we even know the barest little bit about. Yeah, right, right, right. I mean, it would be really cool to get like some religious historian in here that knew about this particular lineage, which I'm sure there's very few of those, but (laughs) (laughs) yeah, yeah. Um, it's not a, you know, you start getting into small, small groups, you know, but, you know, I'm wondering if from the perspective of the Japanese even is Western Soto Zen different mm, to them? Sure. Like they like, is that a different thing in all together? Well, I mean, I was just talking about this with somebody, you know, Matsuo Kuroshi himself was sort of disdainful of the approval. I mean, that might be too harsh of a word, but he was not, he was not super concerned about the approval of the Soto Shu like officials. I have of heard Sangha. that. And, and the, the, I mean, he had it obviously, but by the time he was in Chicago and like our teacher and the other folks in that Sangha were learning from him, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't, he was just doing his own thing. And so he gave sensei Dharma transmission to be his successor, but it wasn't formally recognized by the Soto Shu. And so at some point, Sensei made the decision to kind of retrain under formal, formally yeah. recognized teachers in order to get that approval from the Soto Shu so that people ordained in our lineage could be a part of like the bigger scene, which does mean sort of is imp- approved by Japan. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard that he, it was um, two, two lineages that he trained under. Yeah, right. He got he got like a double header of of like formal Soto Shu approval in order to legitimize Matsuo Kuroshi's Dharma in the eyes of the official, you know, like Soto school, like high church, which was a pragmatic decision on his part. You know, like it was about sort of the institution of our Sangha. I, yeah. And I think that that was the right thing to do in 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 some respects you know yeah I, me too. I think that people do want that you know authenticity you know yeah they, they want to feel like they they're doing something that's not just like made up on the spot i mean if it is it's just a cult isn't it <laughs> i mean yeah. not the cult in the way of like you know we're going to take advantage of you but as in like a small religion that's 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 you know not really like attached to anything else. Yeah, certainly at least even by the strict definition a potential cult. <laughs> right? Well, yeah, but I don't think uh, our lineage has ever been the one to, you know, rob people of money. I mean, look yeah. at it. Right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, it could do a much better job to be sure. But 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 right, but like it it that legitimacy the legitimacy gives it a sort of safety that yeah. I think people rightly need and want in order to practice maybe in this society it might look different in japan because it would because it's just church you know like it's it's pervasive so you know maybe the exploit like the the weird the weird lineages in japan get through another way they slip through the cracks because it's just like normal to be affiliated uh and so you know under the guise of being affiliated like one local temple uh, is you know grifting people out of money or whatever you couldn't get away with that here because it's exotic and strange and there aren't not a lot of places to go so you know the the uh the only way to gain legitimacy here i think is by formal affiliation and 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 that is a necessary posture adjustment for our lineage in order to find and retain new people to participate and, you know, it makes me feel better, too. Well, yeah, I mean, if I'm being honest, it also it also makes me feel better. I mean, um, it doesn't make me feel any different about Matsuo Kuroshi mm-hmm. 
I think I think I understand where he's coming from. Yeah. Zen doesn't necessarily need the legitimacy. We need the legitimacy as the followers. But the practice itself doesn't. Householders is a production of the Atlanta Soto Zen Center in Atlanta, Georgia, and the Silent Thunder Order. Find us on the web at ASZC.org. Our Sangha depends on your support. You can donate by PayPal to donate at storder.org. Gasho.